So what I'm really going to focus on, the, on this afternoon is the targeted therapy and molecular testing in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. As you saw by Dr. Carey's talk, uh, testing has been very routine in breast cancer for two decades, and we're just getting to use molecular testing for prediction of uh, therapeutic response in lung cancer. This is an, a sample of the rates of these mutations. All these patients are adenocarcinoma, and this was done by a 10-center um, program. And if you see there, about 22% of patients had KRAS mutations, about 17% had EGFR mutations, about 7% had EML ALK. Then there was an additional group of patients that had uh, rates of mutations that are about 1 to 2%, and 44% of patients had no mutation detected. So in the adenocarcinoma patient population, we feel that there are identifiable targets that we can use, and we're beginning to develop therapeutic options for these patients. I think the uh, one molecular test that is most validated is the EGFR mutation, and it was largely validated by this uh, trial. We knew from phase two trials of erlotinib and gefitinib that patients who are chemo-naive, had adenocarcinoma, and never light smoking history, or were Asian, had a hot, much higher response rate than patients who did not have those clinical characteristics. So what this trial was performed in Asia, and they enrolled patients who were chemo-naive, adenocarcinoma histology, never or ex-light smokers under 15 pack years and quit greater than 10 years ago. And they're randomized either to the standard therapy, carboplatin, paclitaxel, or gefitinib, which is an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targets this molecular pathway. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Looking at the primary endpoint of progression-free survival, which is on your left, the trial met its primary endpoint has a ratio of 0.74, p-value 0.01. I think if you look at this, this curve is very, illustrates several points. One, the median is actually very similar because the curves just happen to cross over right at that time point. And I think this reflects that the median does not always reflect the therapeutic benefit. If you look closely, there's a group of patients who seem to do worse on gefitinib than another cohort that seemed to do better on, based on uh, gefitinib uh, on subsequent therapy. Now, look at the overall survival, which is uh, a secondary endpoint. You see that those are equivalent at this point, and that's because there was a high rate of crossover from the chemotherapy arm to the uh, gefitinib arm. And I think that when we use these highly active targeted therapies, that there's going to be confounding factors of crossover most of the time. Now, what they did is they went back and they looked for the rate of EGFR mutations. Most of these are within exons 18 to 24. The clinically relevant ones are exon 19, Exon 21, which are exquisitely sensitive to these therapies. There's also mutations um, G719, and there's another one, 861, that are less sensitive, but they do not have the robust response that the uh, 19 and 21 mutations do. And those patients should be treated with chemotherapy. Now, looking at the rate of mutations, which was a question, because before this trial was done, the clinical stereotype was that this, the rate of mutations would be around 90, 95 percent. But when they went in this very clinically selected group of patients, the rate, as you see, was only around 60 percent overall. And even if you tried to select out based on gender, male versus female, never versus light smoker, you see the rate is very similar. Thus, these clinical characteristics are not sufficient to really detect if a patient has this mutation or does not at this point. When they did this subset analysis, and this was pre-planned, and looked at the EGFR mutation positive patients, the gefitinib, uh, I'm sorry, the gefitinib patients did much better, excuse me, the mutation positive patients did much better with gefitinib compared to chemotherapy, has a ratio of 0.48, uh, and it's significantly, statistically significant. Conversely, the EGFR mutation negative patients did much worse with gefitinib. There, as you see, the has a ratio of 2.85, indicating statistically significant inferiority of the gefitinib in the mutation negative patients. The response rate for the gefitinib mutation negative patients with gefitinib was 1 percent. The progression-free survival was 1.5 months. And these are uh, very uh, poor numbers uh, for activity. Therefore, it's very important that you do the mutation test and not empirically treat the patient based on the clinical phenotype. Now, that was a subset analysis. We like to have our data prospectively validated. And there have been a number of trials that have looked at this. These were either patients who had a confirmed EGFR mutation prior to enrollment or were clinically selected, and then they did a planned subset analysis of EGFR mutation, comparing platinum-based therapy, which is the standard, to EGFR tyrosine kinase therapy. And I've sort of summarized a lot of trials in one slide here, but they're very similar on the theme. If we look here, in the mutation-positive patients, response rates consistently 60 to 80 percent there. With chemotherapy, it's anywhere from 15 percent to a high of 47 percent statistically higher response rate with the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor 
if you look at the progression-free survival, there's a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival with the gefitinib or lotnib compared to chemotherapy. If you look here, the median, though, is around 10 to 13 months. And I think that this is one of our new issues that we face. These patients respond. They have their disease control for a period of time. But then 10 to 15 months, they start to progress. And you need to have some second-line EGFR tyrosine kinase therapy that we need to work on developing. There's not been a statistically significant improvement in overall survival, and that's largely due to the crossover at this point. I think it's important that patients get the EGFR tyrosine kinase in the first-line setting because there's a higher response rate, which means less disease-related symptoms. There's a lower rate of toxicity and a better quality of life. So if you, however, were to detect an EGFR mutation in the second line, I think it's critically important that you use the EGFR tyrosine kinase in that setting. We don't want the mutation-positive patients never to see this drug. Now, I think one of the questions in the United States is that this prevalence of this mutation is very closely associated with tobacco use. And they really wanted to see what the, this is a memorial Sloan Kettering where they prospectively collected tobacco history on patients. And they look and said, well, what is the rate of the mutations depending on your smoking history? Up here is the number of pack years at this point. Here are the number of mutations that were detected compared to the number of tumors. And that's the prevalence. And then there's the confidence intervals. And I think that this is retrospective data, but it gives you a good idea of what the prevalence is. I think if you're a never smoker, we expect around 50%. But just as importantly, patients with greater than 75 pack years had a rate of around 4%. So it's not impossible to have an EGFR mutation, even with a heavy smoking history. And I think that this uh, argues for routine testing for all non-squamous cancers at this point for EGFR mutations. Other situation that this can be used is if you have a biopsy and it's insufficient tissue. I think if a patient has a very light smoking history, it's going to change my therapy 20 to 50% of the time. It's worth talking to that patient about another biopsy. I think that if you're in this range where the prevalence is around 5% or there, I think you really need to think about, well, maybe I should start with chemotherapy and then just maybe use in the second line setting because the rate of the mutation is relatively low. The second gene that has been detected is the eml 4 lk rearrangements. This was first detected in 2007, so I think there's been a relatively rapid time course from detection to a therapeutic intervention. It's estimated that this is around 4% of um, all lung adenocarcinomas. What happens is that there's either an inversion or a translocation that leads to an ALK fusion protein, and this leads to cell survival, tumor cell proliferation, and activation of a number of pathways. This test is a fish assay for ALK rearrangement. In order to be considered positive, you have to have rearrangements detected in 15% or greater of the cells. And you're looking for the split signal represented there versus the non-split signal. There is some technical aspects of this trial where um, this test where, you know, sometimes the test will come back positive or negative depending on the percentage of tumor cells that you have there. The reason why this uh, was, we are excited about this rearrangement is that they developed a therapy for it. It's crizotinib, which is an ATP competitive inhibitor of ALK and melt tyrosine kinase. They did a, a phase one trial that determined the MTD is 250 milligrams twice daily. This, they, they then did an expanded cohort, and to get into the expanded cohort, you had to demonstrate the rearrangement. With the expanded cohort, the primary endpoint was safety and response. There were 82 patients uh, enrolled. If we look at the response rates, the response rates was around 60 percent, and the disease control rate was 90 percent. These are one of the waterfall pl plots that we like to use, where if you're below the 30 percent line right here, it's indicative of a response. Um, and if you're above it, it indicates progressive disease. Looking at the, this is from the time of uh, treatment, the, uh, from the first dose of crizotinib, at two years, around 54 percent of patients were alive, and that's much better than what we see normally on lung cancer trials. Now, there's been further follow-up of this, and I think we can say the response rate's around 50, 60 percent with some consistency. The duration of response is around 42 to 48 weeks, and the progression-free survival is about 10 months at this point. Then patients will progress, and then I think that's a difficult situation because there's no second-line ALK drug available at this time. The other interest is a ROS1 mutation. This was recently reported at ASCO. Um, they did a, looking at adenocarcinomas, they found the ROS1 uh, rearrangement in about 2% of tumor cells. They tend to be younger patients, never smokers, adenocarcinoma. Uh, 
they had cell line data that patients with ROS1 rearrangements would have a very similar response to crizotinib. If you see right there, this is the ALK positive patients. There's the ROS1 positive patients. And I think it's important that there was a strong preclinical rationale for investigating this therapy in the ROS1 rearranged patients. So far, 14 patients have been enrolled. The, this is very preliminary data, but the response rate is around 57%, which is much more active than in the second line of most of our therapies. The challenge that we face in lung cancer is that this is a rare, rare mutation or rearrangement. How are we ever going to do a phase three trial to, to trying to find this very rare rearrangement? Um, it's going to be very hard to randomize patients too. Also, now that they know that there's this activity, so it's a challenge. I think the other mutation, which is the most prevalent mutation, especially in North Carolina where there's a high prevalence of smoking, is the KRAS mutation. And I think that this is the big one that we need to tackle as a field. There's a, a preliminary study that looked at uh, solitinib. This is a, a, a potent and selective MEK1-2 inhibitor. That's an enzyme that is half uh, downstream from the RAS pathway. On cell line data, it, it looks like this medicine inhibits uh, grass mutant cell lines, which is, shows activity. This was investigated in a phase two trial, locally advanced or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, second line therapy. Patients had to have a confirmed KRAS in order to enroll in the trial. They were then randomized to docetaxel and placebo versus docetaxel and selenib. Primary endpoint was overall survival. This is a little bit strange. The original primary endpoint was progression-free survival. After the trial had started, they changed it to overall survival without changing the statistical plan. I don't encourage that method, uh, but it was what was done. Because <laughs> um, I think what it shows you is that when we look at the results, if you look at the overall response rate, it was 0% of the docetaxel. And that's in most docetaxel trials, it's around 5 to 10%. And the docetaxel sletinib is 37%, statistically significant. The hazard ratio is 2.5, 2.1 months versus 5.3. Hazard ratio is 0 0.58, statistically significant. Then in the overall survival, 5.2 versus 9.4 months, has a ratio of 0.80. Most of us would consider this a clinically relevant improvement in overall survival. And if you'd kept with the original primary endpoint of progression-free survival, you could tout this as a positive trial. I think either way, the clinical benefit is such that it validates pursuing this as a phase three trial, especially in the lack of any other KRAS-targeted therapies that are readily available. Now, most of the focus has been on adenocarcinoma, and that's the, the more, about more prevalent of the uh, histologies. But the squamous histology represents about 30% of our patients, and it's uh, heavily associated with tobacco use. And there are um, work being done to detect the mutations in the squamous cell cohort. Neil Hayes has done a lot of this work. So far, about mutations have been identified in 63% of uh, squamous cell carcinomas. I think we really need to work on the therapeutic uh, options here. Personally, I think the challenge of this group is many of them have multiple mutations where it's not the single hit hypo uh, mutation that drives the cancer, but really multiple ones probably due to the prolonged tobacco exposure. And also these patients tend to be a little bit older and more morbid, which may make it a little bit difficult to treat. So to summarize this, um, I think ALK, KRAS, and EGFR uh, testing is routinely done in non-squamous patients. I think that uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase therapy is an accepted first-line therapy for patients with a known EGFR mutation. Crizotinib is used for patients with an ALK rearrangement. The FDA approved this without regard to line, so it could be used in first, second, or third line. I personally feel very comfortable using the first line and have done so because I think the response rate to this medication is much higher than chemotherapy and it's much better tolerated and the patients have a better quality of life. Crizotinib shows promise in the ROS1 uh, rearrangement. We're never going to be able to do a trial on this because it's just so rare. I don't think it's going to be possible. So I'm going to be content to prescribe cruzotinib based on the response data and single arm phase two data. I think many of the uh, other therapies are in development, but I think we're really facing a new change in paradigm. Well, before it used to be uh, lung cancer trials were very simple. Platinum plus drug B, platinum versus drug C, and everyone enrolled. But I don't think we're going to do those trials ever again. I think we're really going to define patients on molecular subtypes, and you have to have the molecular subtype to enroll in the trial. The challenge with this is that it's going to be make the trials more labor intensive, more centers enrolling fewer patients, and I think it's going to be a very big logistical challenge. I think the other challenge that we face is I don't think we can go through life testing three te mutations. They're all negative. Test another three. I think it really begets that we need to do more tumor sequencing. I think Dr. Earp's going to talk about that tomorrow. I think that's really the way to go. Um, 
especially when these mutations are around 1% or less than 1%. Importantly, in our lung cancer tissue is the issue, and we've uh, invested a lot of resources at UNC to make sure that our radiologists, who have been very accommodating and cooperative, do core biopsies. Our thoracic surgeons get us nice big pieces of tissue when they do their interventions. Because if we don't have the right tissue, we're pretty helpless in medical oncology as how to proceed. And this really does require a coordinated effort from a team.